Kia ora kato, nā mai hari mai. We'll open the session today with a karakia. A karakia is a blessing and is a practice of the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa, the Māori people. We'll be utilising a karakia today to clear the space and set good intentions for the day to come. This one is my favourite. It reminds me of one of the two places I grew up, Taupo Nui Atea. And recently over Easter break, when I visited Taupo, I was cycling around the lake and there was a plaque with this karakia on it. And the pathways are etched with the parts of the verse, Araha Atu, Araha Mai. So settling in. Kia hora te marina, kia whakapapa panamo te moana, he arahi mā tātou e te ranga nei, aruhu atu, aruhu mai, tātou e e tātou katoa. Greetings to you all and welcome to today's EHF live session. The Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. In this session today, you're going to hear from Tim Ferriss. He's an EHF fellow who is an early stage technology investor and advisor. And Tim will be interviewing Dr. Suresh, an associate professor at Auckland University. And the topic today is on mental health and breakthrough therapeutics. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A with Tim and Suresh during the 90 minute session, but nearer the end. Some housekeeping first. We're currently live streaming to our Facebook page. The link is on the chat if you want to share it. The recording of the session will be on the EHF website and YouTube channels afterwards. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window for questions at the time during the session, and then I'll harvest them out of it. If you're on Facebook, post the comment section and we will add it to our Q&A box in Zoom. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be doing a live session. I have been looking forward to this for some time. And without further ado, let me introduce the main attraction and the guest of the hour, and that is Dr. Suresh Mutu Kumara Swami. I will hear forward refer to him as Suresh. Suresh is an associate professor of psychopharmacology at the University of Auckland. And he completed his PhD in psychology at the University of Auckland in 2005, after which he joined the newly established Cardiff University Brain Research Imaging Center as a postdoctoral fellow. While at Cardiff, he started research work with the psychedelics and psychedelic compounds in 2011 in collaboration with uh, two very well-known names, Professor David Nutt and Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, investigating the neuroimaging correlates of the psychedelic drugs psilocybin and LSD. In 2014, Suresh received a prestigious Rutherford Discovery Fellowship and returned to the University of Auckland where he works in the School of Pharmacy at the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences and leads the Auckland Neuropsychopharmacology Research Group. Suresh's main research interests are in understanding how therapies alter brain function and behavior and in testing methodologies to measure these changes in both healthy individuals and patient groups, particularly in depressed patients. And of course, this session will have a focus on mental health. So we will delve into that. At the University of Auckland, he has conducted clinical trials in depressed patients involving ketamine, scopolamine, and transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. He has received several Health Research Council of New Zealand research grants to support this work, including a grant to investigate the effects of microdoses of LSD on brain and cognitive function. Suresh has published 117 papers, and his work has received more than 8,000 citations. Suresh, welcome to the session. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tim. Nice to see you. All right. Hopefully I didn't butcher the name too badly. And I will start with trend lines and perhaps just an overview of where we sit currently. And uh, perhaps you could just take some time to describe mental health and or addiction statistics, trend lines in New Zealand. That may be a, a meaningful place to start and serve as a canvas upon which we can discuss other things. Yeah, so, so New Zealand has pretty good data on this because every year the Ministry of Health runs a survey called the New Zealand Health Survey, and they've asked for a long time about um, psychological distress and the amount of psychological distress that um, the adult population is experiencing. So, so in terms of trend lines, so this is conducted every year. So in 2000 and I think 11, 12, when the survey was conducted, 4.6% of adults um, experienced psychological distress in the last month. And we've seen that slowly creeping up uh, to the last data point from 2021, 2020, where it was now at 9.6%. So we've seen a doubling over the last 10 years in the amount of adults experiencing psychological distress, which is anxiety, depression, or um, sort of psychological fatigue. So it's more than doubled. And actually, 
the last and COVID is definitely going to impact on that. We see a little bump on the last one from the first sort of impact of the first wave of COVID and those lockdowns. And I expect that that's going to only get worse um, when the next year's data point comes out because in New Zealand, um, you might not be aware, but in New Zealand, the second lockdown was quite hard uh, that just finished at the end of 2021. So that uh, will definitely have impacted on people's uh, mental well-being. So we'll expect that to go up. So it's not, it's not a good place we're in, but so it's not just COVID. It's been trending up for a long time and it's not getting any better. I would imagine, although I don't want to assume that the, the costs, and there are many different types of costs, but the healthcare costs of these upward trend lines with mental health issues, let's just call them depression, chronic anxiety, treatment resistant depression, uh, are, if anything like the United States, quite high in, in New Zealand as well, uh, not to mention the, the personal costs. Let's talk about just a few compounds first. Uh, and actually, as way of background, could you mention just a few other classes of compounds that you've you've also done research with? Uh, because I think it's important to note that you have done more than study what we would consider to be psychedelics. So perhaps you could just give a bit of context there. Yeah, yeah. So my background is in general psychopharmacology. So before studying psychedelics and concurrently to studying psychedelics, um, I've spent a lot of time studying anesthetics and GABAergic drugs. So GABAergic drugs tend to be kind of sedative. So alcohol is a GABAergic drug, benzodiazepines, a lot of the anesthetics like propofol. Um, so I've studied all those drugs uh, at various times, um, various anti-epileptic drugs. So that kind of class of drugs. And then also uh, we recently did a study of scopolamine, which is a um, muscarinic drug and remifentanil we've looked at in the past. So I've, yeah, I've had a, done a lot of psychopharmacology studies that have nothing to do with psych, uh, psychedelics, although the psychedelic studies are the ones that probably uh, are most well known for in the public discourse because they, uh, attract some interest, I suppose. They, they catch the attention. So we're going to, we're going to talk about the contrast between say ketamine and traditional or classical psychedelics. But before we get there, because I am personally very curious, why did you decide to study scopolamine and what did you find in terms of its, its effects on conditions, whether depression or otherwise, because scopolamine, for those who don't know, is also naturally occurring in many plants that are considered psychoactive or hallucinogenic, some of which uh, are considered quite risky. But uh, how did you determine this as a, as a subject of interest for, for research? Yeah, so uh, we had been doing studies on the antidepressant effects of ketamine, and we'll talk about this later, but you see this rapid antidepressant effect. And so what we were interested in was, are there other compounds out there that might show a similar rapid antidepressant effects? And there was a series of studies that came out of the NIH intramural program. Um, uh, there was two or three intravenous scopolamine studies that appeared to show a similar um, sort of pattern of antidepressant effects. So, and scopolamine is, uh, works very differently to ketamine or other antidepressants being a muscarinic antagonist. So we thought, well, that's really interesting. If that works, then we can study that. And even though it's got a completely different kind of receptor binding mechanism that we could, we could investigate that and then potentially look at, uh, in our study, we looked at antidepression and then if we could, then identify neurobiological markers that would go along with that, then we would uh, sort of have a converging theory of maybe what causes rapid antidepressant responses. The downside, of course, is that we found no antidepressant response <laughs> in, that, <laughs> in that study. But, you know, that, that's the data, right? We, uh, we did a really carefully controlled study. We, unlike the previous research that used an inactive placebo, and we'll get back into this, we used an active placebo that... Uh, a, a compound called glycoperonium that's used a lot in uh, surgery that uh, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier but still is anti-muscarinic and it creates a slightly drowsy feeling and dry mouth and a lot of the kind of side effects that you might get and so we were able we were able to show that participants could no longer distinguish which of the drugs they, that they had and actually we are ascribing most of the antidepressant response that you see to a placebo response so huh. lesson learned 
Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, scopolamine, I don't want to take us too off track, but has some very interesting effects on memory in, uh, in or it's at least it's thought to have some very interesting effects on producing amnesia. Yes, it uh, does, yeah. While, while still having yeah, agency on some level. It's it's a fascinating compound. So let's let's jump to ketamine. Most people, mm. or say many people have perhaps heard of ketamine, uh, very commonly used, uh, and please correct me if I get any of the terminology incorrect, but anesthetic, dissociative anesthetic, uh, does not suppress respiration, at least at the doses that I'm familiar with. It is very widely used in medicine. I believe it's one of the, the World Health Organization's top 100 uh, most essential medicines. Uh, could you discuss ketamine and classical psychedelics and uh, how they differ? And just from an anecdotal perspective, although there's a lot of really good research, which of course you've been a part of looking at the antidepressant effects of ketamine. I know multiple people now who would credit their lives being saved to ketamine. And uh, part of what makes it so fascinating to me is not that it's a silver bullet that works for all people, but it's the, the rapid onset of some of the effects in certain subjects compared to say traditional or conventional SSRIs, which in some folks it can take six to eight weeks, say to exert those types of effects if, if the people respond at all. So could, could you just perhaps uh, give us a primer on ketamine and classical psychedelics and, and how they differ? Because both can be described as having psychedelic effects. So uh, maybe the easiest thing to start was is with the classical psychedelics because it's very much relatively simple compared to ketamine. Uh, so LSD and psilocybin, DMT, they all seem to work through a common receptor called the serotonin 2A receptor. Um, and we think that most of their effect, um, you know, there's probably some other receptors that are involved in parts of the response, but overwhelmingly we think that most of that sort of psychedelic experience is generated from this serotonin 2A receptor and binding there so um, conversely ketamine has very different even though it has these kind of this dissociative or psychedelic effects it's receptor binding so it's a mini and complicated um, so principally it um, binds to antagonizes a receptor called the nmda receptor and that's a glutamate receptor so glutamate is the most common neurotransmitter in the brain uh, we don't hear about it a lot um, and the nmda receptor is kind of interesting because it's actually the receptor that's really heavily involved in uh, neuroplasticity and something called long-term potentiation so that's essentially how brain cells um, it's a receptor involved in how brain cells learn to communicate and strengthen synapses um, so that receptor is really important there but then it also has a host of other effects uh, so um, it binds to GABA receptors. Those are kind of um, the ones involved in inhibition and sedation. It also it binds to opiate receptors and everyone will be familiar with opiates. And then there's other um, monoamine sites like uh, that it interacts with serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, HCN channels, sodium channels. It, it just, the list goes on and on as you go up through the concentration. So it's an extremely complicated pharmacology and it goes even worse because actually ketamine metabolizes into hydroxyketamine, which has um, neuroactive sites as well. And it also, most compounds exist in the left and right state. Uh, they're called racemic. So there's a left and a right state. And so there we have S-ketamine and R-ketamine and normal ketamine is both of those, but actually the R and S-ketamines probably have different receptor binding profiles in addition to all of that. So what we're left with is, is a stew. Um, you could either call it a very rich drug or you could call it a dirty drug, depending on your perspective. It's very promiscuous in terms of its receptor yes. affinity. Could you explain for a second uh, two things. So the first is why scientists would wade into this soup of variables like clinically from the perspective of mental health, what makes it interesting? And then second, what an antagonist does just for people who may not uh, have that vocabulary. Yes. So, sorry. Yeah. So when drugs are in the brain, you know, broadly speaking, it's more complicated, but broadly speaking, an antagonist is something that blocks the activity of something that is going on. So an NMDA antagonist blocks the NMDA receptor, so it stops glutamate working there. Um, in terms of, uh, for ketamine, in terms of, there's, there's both a clinical and a scientific interest there that's 
and they're both really interesting to study, which is why I've been studying ketamine for nigh on 10 years now. Um, the clinical significance is what you mentioned before. So you, you can take patients into the lab and you patients that have had treatment resistant depression, unremitting for years and years and years, and you can give them a ketamine infusion and uh, they, they'll get this really rapid remission in symptoms. And that will you know, manifest itself in hours. Now, people will know ketamine as a street drug, right? And they would say, oh, well, maybe that's just because the person's high, you know, that they've been experiencing this intoxication. So my response to that would be, well, actually, you know, if you then measure the person's depression symptoms at 24 hours after the ketamine infusion, you'll see that they're still not depressed. Now, what we know about the pharmacokinetics, that's how long ketamine lasts in the body. The half-life is about four hours for ketamine. So at the 24-hour time point, there's really no ketamine left in the body at all. So the ketamine's gone. They haven't been high for, you know, 20, 20, 22 hours. Um, so they're not high anymore. The ketamine's entirely left the body, but they're still not depressed. And then what that shows is that they've, the ketamine has changed something in their brain. Right. So that's caused some kind of functional change in the brain. And that suggests and that to move them from a depressed to a non-depressed state. So that's really interesting that there's kind of like a, a switch in there that actually can be clicked. And this ketamine is obviously working on some kind of target that can flick that switch. And that, you know, understanding what that is scientifically is uh, really interesting. And, uh, and while other things can flick that switch, they do it much slower, like SSRIs, they switch it in maybe four to six weeks or transcranial mag TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, that might take um, a month to work as well. But here we can switch it in a day. For a scientist, that's really interesting because you can run it really good experiments uh, because you no longer have to wait six weeks and all these extraneous variables that get in the way of your interpretations. You can just uh, go depressed, non-depressed within a day. And that leads to really tight experimental design. So I want to preface what I'm about to say with the <laughs> statement, which is, I know that the, pl the plural of anecdote does not equal data. Nonetheless, I do think case studies are interesting. And uh, I, I can speak to one, uh, a very cute example, a friend of mine in law enforcement who was suicidal. He had acute suicidal ideation. And many people in law enforcement or in the military, pilots would be another category, are very hesitant to admit to any type of mental challenges or to seek treatment because it can result in leaves of absence and, and uh, basically penalties, professionally speaking. And uh, ketamine did exert those rapid effects. And again, not to say that this should be the expectation for every patient, but there are people who I know who go in acutely suicidal and have come out literally saying, I don't know what I was so upset about. Like, I, I don't know how I was so uh, concerned about X, Y, or Z. And uh, what I'd love to ask you next, just again, to contrast the say classical psychedelics. And uh, you mentioned a number of them, which are in the say tryptamine class. Uh, we probably won't get into like, the phenethylamines and mescaline and MDA and so on, which, which can be very different in some of their subjective effects. But if we just, if we're, if we're looking at say LSD, psilocybin, and then ketamine, uh, if you look at the durability of some of the effects, uh, say for anti-depression, uh, what, is, what is your personal perspective on how they might differ in why they have durable effects? And I raised this because I was recently in a conversation with uh, Roland Griffiths from Hopkins, uh, from Johns Hopkins Medicine, who's done a lot of work with psilocybin, and also John Crystal at Yale, who's done a lot of work with ketamine. And, you know, Roland's perspective was that he, he thinks a lot of the durability of, of antidepressant, antidepressant effects, six months, 12 months of follow-up, let's just say, have a, a lot to do with a change in content. So the, meaning that people are actually able not just to suppress the symptoms of depression, but to address some of the kind of root narratives that are leading to depression. And uh, he, he was less, less sure about ketamine. And maybe there's sort of more of a mechanistic explanation like neurogenesis or increasing dendrite growth, where it's sort of fixing the machinery, so to speak, on some level. 
Uh, what, are, what are your perspectives? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I guess the background to this for people is that the antidepressant response that we see to a ketamine infusion, uh, you know, that will last, any, you know, in our experiences, anywhere from a day or two to a couple of weeks to, to a month. Whereas the data for like psilocybin, that seems to indicate, yeah, like months, half a year, year long antidepressant responses. But I think it, this kind of falls into the we don't know pile from a data perspective, because the models that have been used to um, the experiments have been done between ketamine versus the classical psychedelics have been really different in terms of the therapeutic approaches tried. So when people have been doing these psilocybin assisted therapies, they've been wrapping around an intense amount of psychotherapy, right? So it's, and, and I think it's really important for people to understand when they um, think about, because, you know, you just read these headlines, oh, you know, psilocybin improved depression. Well, actually, it's not just psilocybin. It's the fact that the person's gone into the psychotherapy regimen with a, you know, with a therapist and they've done hours of preparation for the experience. The, the therapist has sat through them through the experience and then they've spent hours and days on integration afterwards. So it's probably about 40 hours of psychotherapy for one you know one psilocybin course so it's not just the drug alone it's it's uh, it's it's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy now whereas the model for ketamine that's mostly been used is basically and the way it seems to be used in your flavor is that people just go into a ketamine clinic and they smash in an infusion for an hour and they go away uh, you know so like and there hasn't really been much studies where people have actually done ketamine assisted psychotherapy and tried to do it. well what if we do you know wrap that similar level? what would happen if we wrap that similar level of psychotherapeutic support around ketamine would that make that ketamine response now stretch out beyond two weeks to maybe a similar kind of time course and it, we've kind of because of the people in the psilocybin world have come from that kind of more tra traditional psychedelic assisted therapy world and the people that have been studying ketamine have come from more of a kind of traditional psychiatry world. And so we haven't, we don't really, I'm not aware of any data that really has kind of tried to find them, the man in the middle or, or strip back psilocybin to just psilocybin, which I think people would ethically struggle with trying to do that kind of experiment. So. And do you say that just because of the, the, the difficulties that can come up in navigating that experience? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, these are, um, you know, very powerful. So something like psilocybin is very powerful in terms of psilocybin and DMT. LSD. These are very powerful psychological, have very powerful psychological effects and they can be destabilizing for people. So uh, people need to be well prepared that they're going to experience very unusual, profound, potentially disturbing things. Uh, and to not provide that preparation might be not be ethical uh, to strip it back to nothing like it's done for ketamine. Right. <laughs> but it, it, and then there's probably a middle point where it could be stripped down to sort of the minimal viable support on the front side and then still provide the support on the post-session side. And this, this also highlights for me, you know, the I don't know, that we are really in a, in a very fertile, nascent period of psychedelic research. And even though studies were conducted much earlier, say in the 60s, they don't really meet our standards for study design that we would have today. And certainly with the imaging techniques that you have, fMRI and, and others that are now at hand, you can simply... You can examine these these tools with a set of lenses that you couldn't before, and it, it's it's really been astonishing to me see, to see how far very little money can go in this space compared to perhaps other areas like oncology or car cardiology, for instance. Um, could you speak to how you pick your studies? For instance, the LSD microdosing study. Why did you choose to uh, pursue that study? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So that so I had returned to New Zealand in 2015, and 
having previously done classical psychedelics, I went my, and I started my research group here. I thought, well, let's we'll start with ketamine because you know it's approved. It'll be easy, reasonably easy to get approval for, and uh, and no one's going to blink too many eyelids about uh, a new guy coming into town wanting to study ketamine. The new guy coming to town wanting to do LSD is probably going to fluffle a few more feathers around the faculty. I would have thought back in those days um but having sort of built a bit of a reputation i decided it was time to um, get back into doing some classical psychedelic research now the microdosing specifically was well uh, no one had really looked at microdosing in a rct at that point and it's a randomized the, control trial randomized control trial and i guess does uh, should we explain what microdosing is maybe first? Why, don't, why don't you explain what that is and yeah. um it all it also might segue into the one of the design challenges meaning uh placebo control uh yeah, <laughs> in yeah, yeah, yeah. overall so yes please uh, define microdosing yeah so microdosing is uh when people take very low doses of uh, psychedelics about the tenth the dose of a um big dose of a when people are going to be tripping so you know people might trip on like you know 100 150 micrograms of lsd but for microdose they might take 10 micrograms say uh, so about a tenth and it causes well we don't really know exactly what it causes yet because we haven't studied it properly but users report that they that they have improved mental well-being concentration and in, in, uh, increases and so what they do is that they take um these microdoses maybe every third day is the most common schedule that's called this was popularized by james vadiman who wrote a book in 2011 and it's really taken off since then you know like before 2011 not many people were doing it and there was really not much consciousness about it um but now we're seeing um you know hundreds of thousands of probably of people around the world um, now microdosing you look at the the size of the reddit forum subscriptions just going up and up and up so there's a huge amount of people out there microdosing um, these classical psychedelics every third day many are giving up their antidepressant medic medications to do this um, but there's really no clinical trial evidence about it and not even in mental health patients just not anything now the reason that is is because um, if you wanted to run a proper rct a proper randomized control trial of microdosing uh, a psychedelic then you have to prescribe a class a substance a schedule one substance for people to take home and um, most legal systems won't allow you to do that i don't think you could do that in the united states i don't think the dea is going to be very happy about i think it'd be i think they, they might be a little grumpy about that yeah yeah and so there's not many jurisdictions where that could be done so However, there is one jurisdiction where it can be done legally, um, and that's uh, little old New Zealand. Um, so as I um, was, uh, as you do every now and then, read the uh, reading the Misuse of Drugs Regulations from 1977 and the Misuse of Drugs Act that goes along with it, we kind of discovered this loophole i don't know if you call it loophole but we're actually uh we're allowed to prescribe class a substances it's not ever really done been done but it's just sitting in the legislation saying that this is allowed to be done so we engaged in a long process with the ministry of health um you know and provided a legal reasoning for why this could be done um and so we did it and applied to them and got the appropriate approvals from the ministry, various parts of the ministry to do it. And that allowed us to um, run the study that we've just finished collecting data for, which was to give um, 80 healthy volunteers a six week LSD microdosing course to where they would take the first one in the laboratory and the other 13 doses that were taken out in the wild, as it were, much like people do uh, in real life. So let's let's dig into that a little bit. So uh, were they given the other 13 doses to take home all at once or did they come back to get one at a time? Yeah, uh, or some, were, two at a time? <laughs> yeah, they were, they were given uh, packs of four, four and five. So we never gave them like 130, 140, 30 micrograms to take home so that they couldn't just stack them all up. But actually, you know, there's a, there's a lot of like, theoretical concern about this but actually to get into one of our trials um you know participants have to do multiple screening sessions they spend hours getting 
getting scanned and having all sorts of probes attached to their body to record all their physiology, getting pricked with needles and blood taken and all sorts of stuff, right? It can hours and hours. There are a lot more efficient ways to get doses of LSD. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. So, yeah, so this, absolutely. And we track, we track every single dose was administered and video recorded by the participants and sent to us. So we knew there was 100% adherence to the protocol. Yeah. And kind of part of the reason that I've been engaging with science in New Zealand uh, is, is precisely for this reason. I mean, you have uh, on some levels a very agile ecosystem compared to uh, the United States, and you have legislation that'll, that would allow you to even consider designing a study like this. Could you speak to how New Zealand can or does foster scientific and research innovation. Uh, you could speak to you know, certainly what you've already mentioned, any regulatory differences, but uh, what else makes New Zealand unique? Uh, what else could make New Zealand unique? Uh, and uh, we, we can go from there. I would love to hear what else is uh, happening in New Zealand that, that you find interesting from a scientific standpoint in this in this domain uh, but let's begin with you know how does or how can new zealand foster scientific and research innovation yeah it's a good question i think um in terms of i think we do have a we have a strong regulatory environment but it's so i'm not saying our regulatory environment is weak it's strong but it's it's capable of being agile and it's small and we're a small country so it's possible to just ring the person up who's involved in this, yeah. that or the next thing whereas in another place you might be trapped behind five layers of bureaucracy to these hidden figures that you know making these decisions in a country of five million there's only so many people who know are involved in these kind of decisions uh, so if you you know uh, uh, are sensible and polite and you know and appropriate you can you know uh, you can ask questions and and get things to move uh, so so we do have that so with small size, I think does come agility. And, and I know that um, uh, there are certainly pharmaceutical companies that are investing into New Zealand psychedelics industry and, and our general medical, um, uh, you know, into clinical trials here. We're an attractive place to run clinical trials because also we're relatively cheap in terms of, yeah. um, the, you know, what you can get on a per dollar basis compared to what you might get in Europe or the United States. So. So that's attractive. Um, what we so we 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 do have a good regulatory environment in terms of um, how we can promote more sort of innovation. I think at the moment the government does take a reasonably hands off approach, particularly in this area. It's taken a completely hands off approach. There's so by comparison, and where we risk falling behind by comparison, Australia they they created a $15 million fund specifically for um, these sort of breakthrough mental health therapeutics uh, where uh, to kind of prime the pump uh, because you do need a certain amount of capacity, you need a certain amount of infrastructure, you need people. Um, so they've set that up as a pump priming exercise really uh, to sort of um, provide all the capability that they need. So we haven't seen any signs of that yet from government that, that there would actually be sort of a more dedicated funding pathway. Now we are able to get funding, but we have to go into the general pot of funding. Um, so we have to compete with all the cancer researchers and the heart researchers, uh, which does mean that when we do stuff and get funds, that our work is of very high, has to be of very high quality because we're competing with our peers that produce you know doing very high quality stuff so we know when we get funded that you know what we're doing is uh rigorous yeah so good you know good news is there is there are regulatory frameworks and federal funding for this type of work mm. bad news you don't have something like the nimh uh, i think it's the national institute on mental health in the united states which might give grants specifically to this type of work you have to compete against uh, every researcher in any given medical field who is seeking funding. Yeah, that's right. And uh, they, I guess, but yeah. They, and there's actually some there's actually some data on that. And actually, what we've seen, and not just psychedelics, just mental health in general, has been underfunded in New Zealand for very mental health research, not alone, let alone treatment services, 
mental health research has been underfunded in New Zealand relative to the burden of disease that we see in the country. So just speaking overfunded and we've spent a huge amount of research dollars on things like neurology um, and um, cancer and heart. They've actually, relative to the burden of disease, they've, they've done very well, uh, but actually mental health, relative to the burden of disease we're seeing in the population, this can be quantified using um, disability adjusted life years and you can look at research income relative to, to disability adjusted life years and mental health is not um, being given the funding it needs so there's an argument that New Zealand does need to carve out specific not psychedelics but mental health research to so that you know to make sure that we're getting that research done to serve the disability that we're seeing in the population and the health needs. Do you have something equivalent in New Zealand to breakthrough therapy designation? And I ask because the FDA here in the U.S. has granted both psilocybin and MDMA-assisted psychotherapy breakthrough therapy designation for depression, different types of depression, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, respectively. Uh, do you see ways that the New Zealand government could foster innovation and more experimentation with some type of designation like that? Or for instance, I'm sitting here in the state of Texas in the United States, which for those who don't know, is generally thought to be a very conservative place. But nonetheless, there was legislation recently passed uh, both by the, the, the Republican, so let's just call it conservative and liberal parties uh, to to get state funding set aside for uh, psychedelic research related to veterans, for instance. And that was, that was bipartisan and that will be coming online soon. Do you see any particular tools or approaches that uh, New Zealand might use to further foster what is, uh, I think what already is pretty vibrant uh, ecosystem, but it could, it could certainly uh, do quite, uh, quite a bit more. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think for, I don't. Th I think the latter would be the way to go. So I think in terms of things like breakthrough designation, we don't have. We in New Zealand sit at the end of the pipeline for when treatments come because the way our treatments come is you know an international pharmaceutical company will apply for registration here and they'll use all the data basically they've submitted to the FDA. So you know once they've got FDA or EMA approval, then they might come here for approval after a few years and they bothered to put the marketing yeah. application together. Um, so, so we're kind of at the back end of that kind of process here. And that's why we have in New Zealand, sadly, a relatively weak pharmacopoeia where a lot of drugs that are available in the US or Europe aren't available here um, because they're just not marketed here because we're a small market. So I don't okay. see that the that first approach work, but the second approach could certainly work where you know, the government sets aside legislation, probably, probably wouldn't be through legislation, it would direct one of its funding bodies to sort of, you know, to say, and it does this for other re areas of research, it says, okay, let's, let's fund this, let's fund um, this, uh, things like um, growing up in New Zealand. So New Zealand has a really good uh, history of funding longitudinal research. So there's the need in study in the Christchurch uh, so that would be a mechanism could, that could certainly work um, yeah I'm, I'm very excited about New Zealand as the the tip of the spear for studies along the lines of what you have done you and your team have done with the LSD microdosing study where you have the ability to pilot and innovate in a way that is simply not possible in in some larger places like the United States. And uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, on some level, similar to the way that large global brands in some cases, even though you might be last in line or at the back of the line for certain types of say uh, global drugs that are available elsewhere, you also have companies like uh, I wanna say Adidas and Nike in New Zealand because you have sort of all of the ingredients for English speaking, first world, uh, 
country with incredible research faculties. And I mean, in this particular application, we're, they're looking at commercial interest, but you, you can pilot and run experiments on a, on a, on a small or longitudinal basis that you, you can then uh, apply elsewhere, which I, which I think is incredible. So it's a huge gift that New Zealand also has to, to offer the world in a sense. Uh, who are other scientific inspirations inside of New Zealand? Uh, are there are there other scientists uh, who you think are doing particularly interesting work? Could be limited to psychedelics or adjacent compounds, or could be applied really really any anywhere. Yeah, else. <laughs> well, you know, there's a New Zealand has a rich biomedical um, uh, tradition. So I work in, um, you know, I don't work in a I work in a general medical faculty, so the people sitting next to me are doing, you know, uh, cancer research or, you know, so we have a really amazing uh, people doing work in a place in Auckland called the Liggins Institute, where they're doing work on preterm babies and there's also how... Uh, Stroke recovery research is, is doing really well. And down, down in Otago, I really like uh, the group down there that are doing in the more psychedelic space. They're doing, Paul Glue's been doing a, a huge amount of work with um, ketamine and then various ketamine analogs that he, and different ketamine formulations that they've been working at. And so there's a lot of, there's quite a rich um, group of research happening down at Otago as well. So I guess it's, mostly centered around where the two medical schools are located in New Zealand is where they're kind of where things are happening in the biomedical realm. What do you find interesting with the, are there any particular ketamine analogs that you find interesting? And maybe you could just define what that means uh, for, for a minute. And I also wanted just to, to refer to something you mentioned earlier, you were talking about the metabolites of ketamine being bioactive or psychoactive themselves. Uh, just for those who have a general interest in psychedelics, this is true for a lot of compounds. I mean, it's true for ibogaine and noribogaine and so on, uh, which which certainly makes them more interesting to to study. Uh, but what is a ketamine analog, and are there any uh, analogs or approaches to analogs that you find particularly interesting? Yeah, so maybe it's not an analog. One of the things is they've been I've been looking at like slow release formulations as mm -hmm, as one way right. to go to to see if they. And this comes back to that thorny issue about with ketamine, like how important is actually having the psychedelic experience. But if maybe if you could slow down the metabolism of ketamine, or then you could potentially, if you could slow down the absorption of ketamine, uh, so you, it's not such a hit, uh, but came in slower. So there's really interesting work happening with slow release formulations. There's a New Zealand company who have been looking at that, um, that is Douglas Pharmaceuticals have been looking at this kind of slow release ketamine that's quite interesting. And then there's different companies overseas as well looking at, and I, I described that left and right formation, uh, that have been stripping ketamine to its R and S formulation. Now, Janssen, as you'll be aware, they took the S ketamine, uh, the S part of ketamine, and uh, put that in nasal spray. Uh, Spravato. So <laughs> this is a. Mm -hmm. Yes, bravato, and this is essentially a marketing exercise, right? Like, there's no, it, it doesn't seem that it doesn't any, has any more efficacy than normal ketamine, but it allowed them to achieve a patent on it, and then, and um, in New Zealand, what is, that's what, quite, is the, what is the price differential? I think it's something like one to five dollars uh, generic, like several hundred dollars. Yeah, well, <laughs> bravato, uh, USD, something like. Uh, um, in New Zealand, there's be even bigger the differential because in New Zealand we can get a vial of ketamine for like twenty dollars or something. Yeah. But this, of course, this bravado is like five or six thousand dollars. So, yeah. so it's just the differences are insane. But you know, for a clinician who may not be comfortable with prescribing ketamine off label because ketamine is not indicated for depression. It, it's an off-label treatment. And because it's a controlled substance, people, you know, there are clinicians that get, you know, antsy about that and, and fair enough. Uh, but that ketamine, is ketamine is um, uh, allowed to be prescribed on label. Uh, that may uh, make things easier. The problem with ketamine, the only reason ketamine is not probably is because it's, because it's a generic compound. I guess this is a sort of, background and how 
medicines get approved is you need a company to sponsor the research to go to in New Zealand to go to MedSafe and say, look, here are all our data. Ketamine should be indicated for depression. Uh, but no company is going to do that uh, for ketamine because it's just um, too too expensive and basically any generic competitor can just come and make more ketamine and, and sell it instead. So there's no return on investment to have. To be with intellectual to... property. Let's yeah. let's talk for a second, if if you wouldn't mind expanding on uh, Paul Glue and his work a bit, um, because I, th I think uh, some of it, you know, may may give indications for other approaches that can be taken by researchers to do this type of work. Would you mind just elaborating a bit on on what type of work he's doing? Yeah, so he's been looking uh, at. That he's been doing a slow release work. The other thing he's been looking at is other um, internalizing disorders. Uh, so he's done a lot of work uh, looking at ketamine and anxiety deport disorder. So, and he's starting to put up quite a good evidence base that ketamine isn't just, might not just have efficacy in depression, but in a range of sort of rumen internalizing disorders. So um, I think he's done anxiety and social anxiety. And so ketamine is, seems to have um, therapeutic effects beyond just the category of depression. And these are all kind of, there's less data on these at the moment. So there's, you know, um, you would be even more reluctant to prescribe off label for those things where there's a small evidence base, but there is a, an emerging evidence base that other things, and Paul's definitely been contributing to that. Um, and I wanted to also for people who may not have familiarity with the the odd medley of indications that psychedelics can be used for. Uh, first of all, I, I would recommend to those who haven't read it, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan gives a pretty good overview. Uh, you know, some of it would be contested, like the importance of the default mode network uh, and the down regulation of such um, in some of these experiences, but it would appear and uh, certainly that I think a lot of data would support this, but, but the, the, uh, the case studies themselves also would that the, the let's just say DSM described in, in our parlance over here, at least, I'm not sure if you guys have an equivalent of a DSM, but for, we use for the insurance, DSM, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for insurance reimbursement purposes, you need a, an indication and a code, right? So you could have anorexia nervosa, you could have obsessive compulsive disorder, whatever the latest uh, rephrase of that is, alcohol use disorder, right? Otherwise known as alcoholism, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what is plausibly the case is that these conditions actually share a lot of common DNA, so to speak, because uh, there, are, there are certainly studies being run right now, and, and this is not to say that psychedelics are a panacea at all. That's not the point I'm making, but that from opiate use disorder to anorexia nervosa to OCD to chronic anxiety, there may be shared characteristics such as a rigidity in thought looping or patterning that are interrupted by these tools, which then provide a window of plasticity within which you can do very, very interesting things, which then begs the question that we were discussing a little earlier of how much the therapeutic wrapper impacts the clinical outcomes, right? So if you're heating up the, the clay, so to speak, and adding some moisture by using these compounds, like who is actually molding? Is it the patient? Is it the therapist? Is it the combination of the two? Is it the experience itself that's just bathing your neurons and various uh, chemicals that produce dendrite growth? Um, part of why this whole field is so exciting to me is because there's still so many open questions, the answers to which have just supremely, uh, uh, you know, potentially important ramifications. Um, are there any particular studies that you would like to do or see done in the in the near future in the next few years? Uh, there's so you know, there's endless possibilities. You know, like we're we're only at the we're only at the really beginning of what we're doing, right? Like we've only been doing this stuff for like a couple of years, like and essentially all the stuff, everything that's been done so far is essentially just elaborate pilot studies, right? Um, we we're just beginning to learn and you know that's come from 50 years of prohibition where we haven't been able to do this work so you know 
things were looking and people will know this might know this history that in the 1960s when this research started slowing down in the early 1960s you know there was promising signals but everything just stopped for like almost 50 years and um so we we're only just you know a couple of years into like learning how to do these kind of studies again so that means that you know we've got a lot to learn and it's going to take a while before we figure this stuff out because studies take a long time to do but the things that we and the other thing is these are really complicated interventions you, you know when you put them into a clinical trial and you try to uh, uh, work out what the hell is going on you know because the first you alluded the first problem we have is diagnosis right like we unlike for mental health you know the really thing to be aware of is unlike cardiology or cancer right we can't just like stick someone get an echocardiogram done and realize they've got some kind of thing going wrong with their heart some regurgitation or valve thing or whatever it is or we can't measure a tumor size and oh, yeah, this is it so the, the physician is based entirely basically uh, you know putting aside some organic issues the diagnosis is basically just subjective reports of symptoms and and, and the diagnostic categories are completely woolly and we don't understand the biology of what's going on in terms of the diagnosis and then we have the problem that we give this intervention that we have a only a partial knowledge of what it's actually doing in the body and then actually how, how we actually measure the clinical response is also kind of woolly because we have to use these kind of subjective scales you know like how are you feeling i'm feeling better okay you're feeling better so and we don't, you know, which you know which if you're measuring like you know tumor size in a petri dish you know that's uh what tumor growth that's you know uh so we have a long way to go to harden up the science but to answer your question more specifically the things that we really need to the interventions themselves are really complicated we have this strong drug intervention with these therapeutic wraparounds and we have to start to systematically deconstruct what's going on there and start to start to manipulate some of those variables some of those factors as variables so like how much wraparound therapy do you need the question that's never really been asked is well what type of therapy do you provide or is all therapy the same or is it or is it just heck actually like talking to somebody you know like yeah. you know what is the actual requirements there to get because you will have no shortage of like case reports like you said of people that you know just took psilocybin by themselves and uh said oh yeah i started feeling better and with no like thing not i'm not saying you should do anyone should do that by the way but just uh people will report that of course at the same time people report taking psilocybin and having a terrible experience and you know and with terrible psychological shock involved afterwards so we do have to start to deconstruct what's actually going on in the intervention so but these are long complicated experiments that require a lot of people a, a lot of manpower and each intervention is really complicated so each data point is like gold dust to, to collect yeah Absolutely. So I want to add just a little bit of commentary for people who don't have the history. So you mentioned the prohibition, meaning the banning of common use of these substances for 50 plus years. And um, I would say, at least when we look at the case in the United States, that it was mostly, if not entirely for political reasons, as opposed to scientific reasons. Um, and uh, one can really learn quite a lot about the history, including Nixon and other colorful characters uh like uh, like leary and and so on and so forth but the the punishment didn't really fit the crime in the in the sense and that's my perspective that if you look at the uh the say ld50 so the 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 dose at which 50 percent of a given subset of the population would be expected to die of overdose for these compounds um, you have incredibly high if not unknown ceilings for a lot of them Right. I mean, they're physiologically uh, very innocuous uh, compared to even something like uh, acetaminophen, for instance, where at least in the U.S., I don't know about New Zealand, but there are, I mean, the, the rate of ER admission, emergency room admissions for acetaminophen is, is through the roof. It's got to be top 10. Uh, that is not to uh, say that there are not significant psychological implications, uh, particularly for those who are generally going to be ex uh, excluded by study criteria like those with family history of, of schizophrenia. Um, and we're going to jump into, into Q&A in about five minutes. But uh, what I would like to just make note of really quickly is that I feel the 
the LSD microdosing study that you just uh, finished gathering data for is, is a really important first of its kind, and please poke holes in this if I'm getting any of it wrong, for a, a number of different reasons, but I'd like to highlight one of them. And uh, one of them is placebo control in uh, psychedelic studies or studies involving psychedelics where it's incredibly difficult <laughs> to have placebo controls uh, at larger doses with something like psilocybin or LSD, because it is, it, it is tremendously obvious to anyone who has taken it that they've taken it. And if they haven't taken it, it's very clear that they have not taken it. Um, and there's gonna be expectancy effects and generally people are gonna come in knowing on some level what psychedelics are or believing that they do and having done some reading and so on, right? So you have placebo effects, uh, we won't even get into nocebo effects, which people read up on because that's also something worth looking at. But in the case of microdosing, it seems like you, you really can begin to apply placebo controls. And uh, just for people listening, could you describe how you thought about that and whether you decided on, on uh, passive or active placebo? Yep. So for this study, we went with the inactive placebo. Uh, just because, because no one had ever done LSD microdosing before. We wanted to react for, in the community, we wanted an inactive control so that we were comp when we looked at safety and like physiological measures of safety, we had a really like, just like not, we've not actually done anything to these people. We haven't given them any drug. This is just pure. So we had a very pure safety group to look at. Um, and in terms of, whether people are you know able to detect the effects some are some are so we are around this was at threshold. around uh, 10 micrograms so i suspect what was yes yeah, about 10 10 micrograms uh in male volunteers so there might be a there's quite a heterogeneity though actually we, we saw that some participants were particularly sensitive to it and we had to reduce doses for some participants um, and some hardly noticed so there's quite a variability in people's response and that's interesting in of itself it suggests to me that we're probably when we move on to the next phase and actually want to look at a clinical population and run like a for example a depression trial that we we'll, we may need to start looking at lightly active placebos that um because we're now interested in the clinical outcome not just sort of like can you do it what do people experience now, if we're wanting to kind of try to fool people a bit better um then probably some kind of light placebo and with a little bit of a little bit of uh i wouldn't say deception but just ambiguity in in the information that we provide to participants might be enough to get us over the top in terms of blinding the study successfully unlike psychedelic studies which aren't blinded at all and this is a real problem a methodological problem that the field has to try to conquer in some way uh, yeah. and we're and, working on and, that. Yeah. so the i just want to jump jump in for a second so i would say also that the, the fact that placebo controls are so difficult is uh it's i, I don't want to say a feature and not a bug because it does present just from the standpoint of rigor and publication a whole lot of challenges but the fact that this effectively entire class of drugs has so much trouble with placebo controls is very interesting right in and of itself <laughs> i've written a whole a massive paper on this topic so yeah, uh, yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's 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 uh, it, it is fascinating that it's so hard uh, do you have any, and you don't have to give away your secrets, but anything on the short list for potential active placebos that you, you would use in such a case? Niacin, something Niacin's else? A, niacin's not a great option. That's um, yeah, yeah. A, a vitamin. So actually, niacin was used in the 1960s, and it's been determined yeah. even in 1960 that niacin is a poor control for side of But people used yeah. to use it for some reason, uh, and I'm not uh, sure skin, why. Yeah, skin flushing. I mean, maybe skin some flushing. type of sub subjective experience that people think it's doing something. That's yeah, so we get to a lot of dietary supplements as well, just like beta we, we're getting into the weeds here. But what I would say is actually what the compound is isn't as important as what the participant thinks it's going. It's their belief about what they're receiving. That's the important thing because blinding or not being so blinding. I guess we should step back and to say, well, blinding in clinical trials is really important to prevent expectancy experiences. Because if a person goes into a clinical trial thinking they're getting psilocybin, they do get psilocybin, and if they think it might make them better, they work out that they've had it and they go, oh, and maybe that over 
over accentuates their clinical response, which we would call a confound. Now, um, so that's potentially a problem. So, but what's important is it's not the compound itself. It's what the participant believes that they've had. And so it's not as much potentially around what the actual active placebo is, but what you tell the participant about the active placebo and the information that you provide them. And the, because you're not trying to manipulate your physiology, you're trying to manipulate their belief system and their beliefs about what they're having. So I think these are subtle things that we need to really think about in our experimental design. It's, you know, this is why I really enjoyed doing research in this area because these are fascinating problems and it's a really like fascinating area to try and work out these scientific problems that, you know, yeah. the, you know, that's, I reckon we can do it. I'm, I'm not, you know, give me another 10 or 15 years and I might give up. But right now I think, you know, we can totally crack it if we put our brains to it as a, as a scientific discipline. It's, it's, it's a really exciting time to be, for me, you know, certainly observing, watching to, to, and, and to, this, to the extent that I can supporting the ecosystem and a really exciting time for people like you to be doing the research. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's really kind of a blue sky opportunity and the payoffs, as I think we established very early on in the conversation are potentially huge, uh, huge if we look at the trend lines of various uh, diagnoses and illnesses and the the costs both on a personal level familial level and societal level so let's jump to q a at this point if that makes sense and i'll hop over to michelle to see if you have any any questions for us i think we have quite a we a do number. actually yeah we've got heaps of questions here um, what I'm going to do though, Sharesh, is I'm going to start it off. The first question is going to be um, an ask. So you can put your ask out there to the audience. Because someone has said is, how can we speed this up? What can be done to make the benefits of this coming forward a lot quicker? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think, you know, we've got plenty of awareness around mental health generally in New Zealand. I think we haven't, and... We haven't seen government or any signals from funders about, and I think that's where we haven't really seen any kind of movement. So if any, if you have like, that's where pressure can potentially be applied, right? And there's not much, there's not much in the way of like foundational advocacy for this kind of stuff in New Zealand, or there's not a huge amount of push to like make government do anything about it so i think it's probably where things can be accelerated is by trying to get government to start paying attention uh, and and taking for them to take the attitude that we can be at the forefront and you said we can be at the forefront of this and we already are like we're way batting above our in terms of like us being this tiny little country at the, at the back end of the world we are batting way above our way and we could you know get onto the front of these things being introduced if they are appropriate to be introduced but a few bit more push from government would potentially accelerate that and you know and really establish us as leaders in the field. Uh, Suresh just to piggyback on that uh, for those in the audience who might want to support as uh, in a philanthropic capacity uh, certainly I've been interested in the space for a long time it's it's uh deeply affected my life and the lives of, of many I know. And the science is important at the end of the day <laughs> to push the ball forward. Uh, so whether uh, with you at University of Auckland or at University of Otago, uh, there are some some interesting things happening in New Zealand. Are, are there uh, any recommendations you might have for people who uh, would like to consider supporting philanthropically? Uh, yeah, in terms of philanthropics, what the best thing is to get in touch with either myself or Paul. Uh, you know, we don't, we're not top secret uh, things. That, you know, there's, there's plenty of mechanisms, you know, but what I would say is that certainly philanthropic money is really important. And, you know, the funding that you provided us was like essentially seed money that we could use to um, then get, you know, the feasibility you need to then get a government grant to do the research, yep. to establish Definitely you know, to establish that, you know, we can run this trial, we can do it, um, because starting when you have nothing, you, you just can't get started and you apply for a grant this, and then the grant people say, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you haven't shown us that you can do this, that, and the next thing, and then they turn the grant away, right? So philanthropic money 
can also be seen as a seed, not just yeah. as you're funding a whole thing, but as a seed for future. Investments. Definitely. Yeah. That's, uh, that is so important. Uh, I just want to say it again, that not only do you sort of punch above your weight class in the research that I've seen so far, but the amount of money that you commit from a philanthropic standpoint can also have much more impact and a sort of amplifying effect as a signal, right? Because then it allows researchers to fundraise that much more easily from other sources. Uh, so the, the money is important, of course, but the signal is also really important. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Michelle, do you have yeah. uh, do you have more? I'm sure you do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so this one, um, what are the risks of micro dosing? So if it's patients that are diagnosed with bipolar or schizophrenia, so they're not looking for a medical advice, but just any general commentary about how safe it is it and is it dangerous? You know, we don't have a lot. We we have a data set uh, and that we've collected and it's really the first data set that's been collected. And so far we haven't seen any uh, negative safety things, but it's a very small data set in a very healthy population. So I think... Potentially, there are indications such as schizophrenia or bipolar where it's probably possibly not a good idea. We know that um, high doses of psychedelic can trigger psychosis uh, occasionally and, and cause psychological distress. So I think doing this kind of on your own, if you, particularly if you're trying to treat a severe mental health disorder, could be, you know, uh, you're heading into the unknown, I guess, is that kind of thing. So. Um, but yeah, so there are potentially the biggest risks probably apply actually in the application area of mental health uh, and particularly with um, uh, particular comorbid disorders. So um, I think it's important to treat lightly, carefully. I'll, just, I'll add something to that really quickly, which is there, there are also questions of provenance and yes. legitimacy. So uh, there are there are some synthetic, well, I mean, a lot of synthetic, thousands of synthetic psychedelic compounds that um, are sometimes confused or sold as, confused with or sold as LSD that that can launch you into some very um, uh, at best uncomfortable and at worst very dangerous circumstances where you could you could be in an experience for you know, 24, 48 hours. And uh, on top of that, it's, it's critical, I would say, to consider legal ramifications. There are legal risks if you're dealing with Schedule One compounds. And secondly, just because I've seen this quite a few times, we're dealing with, in the case of LSD, for instance, micrograms. Okay, so to explain what that means, <laughs> Suresh, please get me, uh, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but you've got, you've got let's just say milligrams, which are uh, a thousandth of a gram. Am I right so far? Uh, yeah, uh, milligrams is and, a thousandth, a, yeah. and microgram is a millionth of a gram. Uh, if I'm getting that right, or is that a- Yep, is that, yep that's right. Yep. So, so, all right. So if you're dealing with millionths of a gram, even the Albert Hoffman, who's the father of LSD, I mean, went on his first famous huge trip while bicycle riding because he got it on his fingers. And so you're dealing with such incredibly small quantities that the- the ability to misdose or to absorb it through the skin can lead to something that is most certainly not a microdosing experience. And uh, if you're doing it without supervision and you happen to get in a car expecting it to be a microdose, for instance, that could be very, very tragic indeed. So I just, not to be the stern dad about it all, but felt the need to say that. No, these are absolutely true that the non-physiological risks are probably far greater than the physiological risks. Um, and we, in New Zealand, yeah, um, even though the law enforcement deals with things like Schedule C class, which is like cannabis relatively lightly these days, actually they're not so forgiving with Schedule 1 substances. So that is important uh, to bear in mind. And I forget often, yeah, the, you're right, absolutely right again about the purity of supply and dosing. I mean, I forget this because we have, I like to say, the best LSD in town in my lab, but <laughs> like, uh, but uh, uh, joking aside, yeah, like illicitly in pain, LSD um, or psilocybin could be cut with other things. And, and it's very hard to know. Yeah, absolutely. But we do have drug, we do have drug tracking services in New Zealand that can 
provide that kind of information. And I'll, and I'll just actually, that's a, that's a really good point to just add one thing to, which is in the US, there are services like Dance Safe and others that will provide drug testing kits, uh, which is not to say I recommend illicit use of drugs, but the reality is that people are going to use what they believe certain compounds to be. And uh, there are tools also for testing so that you try to mitigate some of the risk. Yes. There's a few people in the audience, Sharish, that are doing studies themselves in, say, Toronto and, and the US. And one of them is about the questions about open science. So what are your thoughts about open science replication crisis? And will you be sharing your data or will you be keeping it private? Um, well, you know, it depends on, you know, uh, yeah, so it depends on the study and it depends what you're trying to do. So open science is, is admirable and it's good, but it's not always possible depending on, you know, who's... Suresh, could you define that just for people listening who are not uh, familiar? Yeah. So open science is um, essentially sort of releasing your data to the world when you have it. Um, and, um, and it goes with another thing, which is called pre-registration, which is basically publishing your clinical trial protocols before you actually do the study. So my lab group has definitely started doing publishing clinical trial protocols before we do it. So we're, and we've done open science things. So I'm in favor of it where you can do it, but there will be times where you, for example, you're doing industry funded work where that's not possible because that's intellectual property of, of said company. So, you know, um, uh, so I'm generally in favor of it, but I think, you know, uh, but also we do end up with the open science, you know, of having a lot of data in the world, but no interpretive framework. So you can, you can we can all do thousands of experiments and, and release, terabytes and petabytes of data into the world with uh of potentially bad data or which you know hasn't been collected well or and and just adds confusing signals to the noise so you know um i don't know that it's a panacea for actually a, a deep theoretical understanding of what's going on um, thank you now we're going to shift to a training question. So anticipating legislation change and increasing access to psychedelic assisted uh, psychotherapy, how do we prepare the workforce and to be able to provide this? So what training pathways exist already for psychologists, clinical social workers to upskill and become involved? Uh, this is this is a big controversy. <laughs> Tim, do you want to yeah, I, I, I can I can take a stab. I can take a stab. The uh, there are there are a number of concurrent experiments being run. <laughs> so uh, in the United States, a lot of eyes are on Oregon, and uh, within the state of Oregon, uh, there will be a lot of action in the next six to twelve months, looking at developing effectively a parallel structure for registering and uh, supervising administration of psilocybin for psilocybin assisted therapies. Uh, so that is a very live question for the state of Oregon. So I'd encourage people to watch that very closely on a political medical level. Also, you know, my, fa my foundation, so the SAISE foundation, uh, S-A-I-S-E-I -S foundation.org for people who are interested, uh, has, uh, also participated in funding a joint program uh, which is focused on psychiatry. And this is at Hopkins, NYU, Yale, and possibly a, a few other institutions. I apologize that I'm forgetting where, and I'm, I'm going to get some of the details wrong here, but in effect, a certification program is being created that can be applied into this funnel, which already exists, and that is the sort of psychiatry MD training. And people can elect to then add this type of training and, and qualification um, to their pre existing track, if that makes sense. Uh, which is not to say that this should be limited to being administered by MDs or MD PhDs. I don't think that will come close to addressing the demand and need, more importantly, the need. Uh, forgetting about healthy normals, which is a whole separate conversation. Let's just talk about people with actual uh, sort of clinical diagnoses. Uh, 
So there, there, I, I do expect that there will be similar experimentation with nursing schools. Uh, I hope there will be uh, also experimentation within uh, accredited social work programs for allowing social workers. Uh, but the, you know, the, the fact of the matter, I think, is that this is one of the most challenging issues that will be faced in the next five years, next five to 10 years, uh, because not only is it necessary to develop a pipeline for training, but the, the training is extremely controversial because there are people who feel like the sacred is being secularized. And therefore, if there aren't enough uh, legally trained uh, let's just say therapists or facilitators to administer these drugs, that there will be uh, a lot of gray market and uh, sort of black market charlatans who are going to pop up to provide services to those in need, which will cause its own large host of problems. So it's going to be a challenging road ahead, but there are experiments being done and uh, people can see uh, can see some of them at the, at the foundation. If, if someone website. can put that URL up. That would be great for the audience. Um, and now, is there a way, this is for New Zealanders, is there a way that we can access psychedelic therapy microdosing now? Or uh, how no, no. <laughs> you know, you, ketamine is potentially available through, um, there are a couple of clinics around the country offering ketamine services for those with depression. But psychedelics and um, microdosing are still, in the future, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, microdosing particularly has got a long way to go, five problems, uh, depending on how the results look. But I think the first thing that's going to come down the pipeline, if anything, will be the MDMA assisted therapy, because that's the most advanced psychotherapy for PTSD. So it's the most advanced, that's in phase three clinical trials in the US. We have a group of MAPS trained therapists actually in New Zealand that could actually deliver that therapy um, if the data was seen to be okay and our regulator were to improve it, which would invariably happen after FDA if that were to be approved now. Um, so we have that, um, and that might be only a couple of years away. And that would be the first kind of cab off the rank, I think. Um, yeah, and I, I'll just add to that, uh, that if, if I could make an unrealistic request of these psychedelic communities, per se, although uh, with the amount of infighting that goes on, it's sometimes hard to view it that way, that it's really important to focus on ketamine and MDMA and getting those two right. And uh, I think it's very risky. It's fraught with incredible risk to try to boil the ocean at once with adding in you know, NNDMT, 5-MeO-DMT, ayahuasca, and every other compound you can imagine to try to get them all dealt with in a responsible way simultaneously. Uh, now, I don't think anyone's actually going to follow that advice, but, you know, I have a, a pretty broad spectrum of, of uh, interaction with these things. And I would just say, uh, not as an expert by any stretch, but just someone looking at the, the risk benefit profiles of these things. Uh, I think a focus on ketamine and MDMA assisted psychotherapy would go a very, very long way. And uh, psilocybin certainly is in the works. And I think it has tremendous potential for a number of different uh, conditions, whether that be major depressive disorder, treatment resistant depression, uh, alcohol use disorder, uh, and I think many others. I mean, those are the three that are kind of furthest along. Uh, but each of these compounds has its own complexities and difficulties. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think slow is smooth and smooth is fast with this stuff. We've just come through half a century of prohibition. <laughs> we don't need to figure it all out in the next six months. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that because, you know, like, there's a design, you know, and you know why, because there's this massive unmet need, right, to get things out to address these things, but, and, and, and it's heartbreaking and pressing problem, but at the same time, you have to think, well, if these things really are effective, you know, why, the last thing you want to do is like rush it and, and get it wrong, and then to be safety issues that come up, or like, you know, badly, badly re regulated things, and you, then all these horror stories start emerging into, 
the popular consciousness and then we put ourselves 50 years back in the hole again so, so i yep. think that's what we really need to avoid with this so treating really carefully but hopefully that won't happen because we do have a stronger regulatory environment than there was in the 1960s so hopefully we can avoid that kind of issue but i think it requires us to work diligently honestly and carefully yeah and then all all of, i mean not to paint a bleak picture but it's just like hey we i think we really want to mitigate the risk of catastrophe that then becomes a political soapbox and then before you know it you have an executive order that sends us back to <laughs> where we were which is not an impossibility people might laugh uh, about that because they feel like this isn't the 60s and uh, the, the generational differences no longer exist and there's bipartisan support etc but politicians are <laughs> uh have certain sets of incentives have certain sets of incentives and uh i i would really say that it is it is it is a non-zero percent chance that things get sent back to prohibition if say one senator's child dies of, of cavalier administration of 5-meo dmt in fill in the blank location right uh and not to not to throw five mao dmt under the bus i think it's very interesting but um you know high degree of thrashing high percentage of thrashing uh within the subset of people who use it so you know bad things can happen and uh bad things will happen also and i think the the people involved which is why uh, the decisive foundation is also involved with the harvard uh poplar project uh which is a law and policy uh project focused on psychedelics uh, because there are going to be suicides that are attributed to psychedelics there are going to be deaths attributed to psychedelics via accidents of various types and this is this is this would be true with any um any drug used at scale right like it's 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 not specific to psychedelics this is certainly true for ssris it's true for just about every drug you can imagine sleep medications COVID and, vaccines uh, <laughs> yeah yeah right vaccines so it's 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 just the law of big numbers in a sense and i do think the community needs to be prepared for that eventuality and how to deal with it because it's going to take the culture quite a bit to metabolize that and we're, I do think we're going to see a, 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 not backlash, but sort of a pendulum swing into negative coverage because the, the, the positive coverage has just lasted too long. <laughs> and I think if we want to be strategic about it, we accept, we ex accept and expect that on some level because it's inevitable with, with anything that is purported to have this much promise and certainly anything that has this much coverage. Uh, Michelle, what else do we have? Yeah, um, is your research expanding a little bit further and going into addiction, which is more dangerous and obviously deadly than depression and anxiety? Are you doing any research in that area? Uh, um, we're starting to talk about it. Um, we're starting to talk about uh, um, a project uh, that uh, will be uh, more... Um, Maori-based intervention that will be run by uh, Maori, intervent uh, Maori researchers. And we're just in the very beginning stages of starting to sketch some ideas together about um, how that might be done um, for that population and methamphetamine use or alcohol use. But it's very early stages for us, but um, definitely that's something we're not leading, but we're just providing support for um, in terms of intellectual support and learning how to navigate the regulatory system on this stuff so that could be really interesting and um uh, there are elements of for example spirituality that um have some synergy with uh maori culture that uh, would be interesting for those researchers to explore yeah i agree so just on that a little bit then what about have you included women in the studies or has it been mostly males uh, we had this one LSD microdosing study where it was where it was males only because we um, uh, we <laughs> I won't say it was pitched warfare trying to get this trial approved, but it was. <laughs> so and so we just had to like take risks down as much as we could in certain places. So the idea of um, the problem of potential pregnancy was um, 
something that we just for this stage we just wanted to avoid that as an issue and there was also menstrual cycle compounds in that that we wanted to avoid for their first trial we think we've now got the steps that we need to expand in the future trials but and and i've taken a lot of flack for this <laughs> and and i say well my response is well you try and like get this study approved over because i spent years aging trying to get this thing approved um so you know we did the best that we can while we could and we always hope to be better um and but certainly um all our other studies have included females and the next studies will um now that we've got over that first hurdle and I, I will also say that there are uh studies that have uh very mixed gender ratios uh, if if you look at uh, some of the end of life depression end of life anxiety studies um uh, say involving psilocybin you see uh you see a much more sort of heterogeneous group uh, so yeah uh, definitely easier to do when you have a little bit of escape velocity after the first one or two pilots yeah there's actually some interesting uh, anecdotal reports of in terms of microdosing for um uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder people have been using it for that and um that it might affect actual menstrual cycles um, and menstrual cycle timing. So that's actually quite an interesting, there's potentially interesting separate studies to be done there that um, we have considered and will consider in the future. Mm. So if um, someone's wanting to sort of get into this type of research, what education do you recommend for anyone wanting to help assist? Oh, so <laughs> I get this all the time from <laughs> undergraduate students. I'd, well, I'd say, you know, the best option is just go be a medical doctor because <laughs> then you can, uh, uh, you learn. But, uh, you know, uh, a university degree, <laughs> maybe I'm just promoting the University of Auckland because it's my employer who pays the bills. But, uh, you know, for, for young people getting a, a science degree or a health sciences degree, um, medicine, psychology, uh, those are, you know, I think, that's where the forefront of things will will be and will be in either met in new zealand it's going to be basically psychologists psychiatrists and psychologists that are going to run this um, it will, um i suspect that that will be where things fall so if you want to, to you know get into being able to like prescribe or be involved in this kind of therapy i think psychology and psychiatry are the and general medicine are the places to study, so all the things to do. Um, and then, if, and then there's also scientific degrees you can do, like medical sciences. Strong background in mathematics is always good. True. And just going to go into one about um, corporate. So, have you looked into the clinical trials of the larger public companies? So there's MindMeb. Ah, someone's just shifting my stuff. Compass, AT, AI, and numerous. And do you feel there are any red flags and how these are current corporations are going about improving their respective drugs? So that's like LSD, MDMA. Um, uh, yes and I, I should say as a disclosure that I have consult for some of these companies and have uh, yeah so um, <laughs> as a disclosure so uh, and, and actually collaborating with one of them so uh, my observations is that um, they tend, they, you know, are people that are really, ex the people that these companies are employing are really, ex seem to be really experienced um, pharmaceutical um, people with a lot of industry experience in pharmaceuticals, and they seem to do quite a rigorous job. Um, you know, there's obviously going to be tensions there for those companies in terms of wanting to get things through reasonably speedily. Um, because they've only got so much uh, capital, you know, the, the pathway is long and expensive and the intellectual property that they need to um, gain because of, you know, these are generic medicines is, is going to be an issue. But um, red flags, you know, there's red flags in every area of, you know, so you have to, what I would say is, oh, well, you know, there's red flags in every area of pharmaceutical development. Are there any more red flags in this area than there are in other parts of the pharmaceutical industry? Probably no more, no less, you know? Um, so, yeah. But I'm comfortable with the gray. 
I'll, I'll hop in with just a few things. So I would say on the on the clinical actual the study side, I think pre-registration is very important. But as you mentioned, Suresh, that doesn't apply uniquely here, but it does apply here. So uh, pre-registration, publishing your protocol ahead of time so that you can't sort of torture the the, the data or or move the goalposts and you know declare victory when in fact um, it was not a victory. I think is is incredibly important. And then uh, you know I recommend people take a look at. Uh, there's a journalist named Shayla Love who's done a fair amount of writing about the intellectual property battles that are ongoing in the space. And uh, there certainly are, I believe, non-obvious innovations that should be granted patents because that is how one in a market-based economy sort of raises funds and builds companies and justifies the R&D expense. There are also obvious, uh, relatively unhelpful non-improvements that people sometimes get patents for, which are obstructionist in nature and um, that actually gum up the works and cause problems in the ecosystem overall, especially if they use said patents to try to uh, lock up manufacturing processes, right? To dominate a given molecule that has existed for decades, if not you know, millennia in some cases. Uh, so, so I do think the IP side of things is very important to, to keep an eye on. And uh, an organization that might be worth checking out is Freedom to Operate, which was created by Kerry Turnbull. And uh, that, is, that is an area that will be increasingly active. Uh, Mason Marks and Glenn, I, Glenn Cohen, I period, Glenn Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, co-authored a paper on intellectual property and patents. Uh, for those who are interested, that's out of Harvard Law School. That's enough time for our questions, actually, team. Goes All right. Back. Well, well, fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you uh, so much, Suresh, for, for making the time. I'm very excited to see what you do next. Oh, thank you. Good. Thanks, team. I'll just close us off for the cutting here. It's been a great session today, and then hopefully this will set you on the rest of your way. Kia tō tia ranga maria, o te rangi nui e tā iho nei, o papanuku e tāko nei, o tāte o nā ahi nei, kuronga e tātou tātou. Tihei mori ora. Kia ora team. Thank you. Kei kite. Enjoy the rest of your evening or day. <laughs>